Welcome to Conservation Conversations, the podcast where we discuss emerging technologies, global trends, and the future of biodiversity conservation with some of the world's leading experts. I'm your host, Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe, where we've been working for 50 years to protect endangered species and ecosystems. With this podcast, we want to introduce our audience to some of today's key players in conservation and share the amazing work being done around the globe to protect our planet's rich biodiversity. Welcome to Conservation Conversations with Sean O'Brien. I'm here today with John Paul Rodriguez, who is the chair of the Species Survival Commission at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, most of us refer to as the IUCN. He is also involved with ProVita, which is a Venezuelan nonprofit organization that works with NatureServe and is part of the NatureServe network. So welcome, John Paul, to Conservation Conversations. Thank you, Sean. A pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, it's uh, particularly exciting for me because two years ago when I uh, accepted the position as president of NatureServe, the very first person who sent me a congratulatory email was you. Uh, because you and I were at Princeton University together when you were a grad student and I was a postdoc. And uh, so um, even though we didn't see each other very much for many, many years, um, we have a long history together. And it's really exciting to be back working with you because I remember um, being at Princeton at that time in ecology and evolutionary biology with the real powerhouse of students and professors at that time. Yeah, and I remember also that you were one uh, sort of a trailblazer, trailblazer for some of us because you were coming to open up kind of the policy uh, perspective of science and, you know, uh, showing many of us that pursuing a career uh, outside of, you know, your classic research path was an option. So that was really inspiring and, and great to see that happening. Oh, I I had no idea, but I'm, I'm glad that that, that happened because it, uh, it was pretty special to be at Princeton at that time because so many of the students there are now involved in conservation work. And I think we were really fortunate to have people like uh, Steve Hubble and Steve Pakala and um, Cy Levin and other people who were interested in science policy and conservation. And it wasn't for them all about who's the next professor of something at some other university. Uh, they were concerned about, you know, making the world a better place. Yeah, no, for me, it was very interesting because when I arrived, that was 93, uh, I was told by fellow grad students to keep quiet about my interest in conservation, you know, that I had to be a scientist and I had to be, I have to have a question. And of course I did, and I did my PhD on a scientific question. But by the time I left, which was in 99, uh, every single faculty member on their website had conservation biology or conservation as one of the things they did. So it was a really interesting time to see in such, you know, such a short span of time how people passed from you know, uh, applied science being a uh, you know, bad word, a flooded word, right. to uh, actually being the mainstream. And that was uh, fascinating to be there. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's awesome for the world because it means that we have all these really highly trained professionals out there who are working on conservation of biodiversity and working for groups like the Species Survival Commission, which is really, really important work. So I'm curious how you made that transition from sort of this uh, graduating from Princeton and then now becoming so active in IUCN and the, this very applied work. Tell me a little bit about your past. Yeah, well, IUCN has IUCN was part of my career from the beginning. So, so Provita, the, the conservation organization that is a member of the Nature Serve Network, we founded it in '87. Uh, we were undergraduate students. I was 19, and all of us were very young. And we started this new conservation organization because we wanted to work on threatened species. Uh, at that point, it was public awareness what we mainly did, but um, we all saw ourselves as being scientists working for, you know, uh, evidence-based conservation. So generating the science that supported conservation decisions. And uh, that was 87. By about 91, I was a member of the of conservation breeding specialist group, it was called back then. Uh, Provita was already established. We wrote the Red Data book, the first 
red list of Venezuelan animals in, by 95. So at that point, I was already super involved with IUCN and national red lists. So every step that I've, that I've taken in my career has been a combination of, of being a scientist, being a, a you know, conservation NGO, and being in, in IUCN. And it's great because I sometimes can wear the hat of the activist. I sometimes can wear the hat of the, of the scientist and, and so right. on. So uh, IUCN has been there throughout. By 96, I was asked to join the National Red List Working Group of IUCN. And a few years later, I was deputy chair of SOC. So here I am. It's been a very, it's been very constant. IUCN has always been there 30 years. So IUCN in our field is a set of letters that we say pretty freely and openly. Yeah. Uh, but how would you describe IUCN to someone who's not in the conservation field? Yeah, so for me, I, uh, what, the way that I see it, IUCN is a, is a federation, a global federation of conservation organizations. And it has the really unique characteristic that it brings together governments, non-government organizations, indigenous people organizations, and the private sector as members of the union. So it's about, you know, 1,400 members at the moment. But on top of that, IUCN also has uh, six... Um, networks of volunteers around different topics like environmental law education and communication protected areas etc and one of them is species so uh, ssc the species of our commission is one of those expert networks we have about ten thousand members in 174 countries and this is easily the biggest network of conservation experts of the world and um, my job I always joke as I'm, I'm the cheerleader of this network. So I go around trying to make sure that they can deliver. And what they deliver is knowledge and expertise and what we know about threatened species worldwide, about all taxonomic groups, you know, from from um, chytrid fungi to blue whales, you know, mm -hmm. several orders of magnitude. They're all there. So it's really a fantastic group of people. Yes, one of the things that the IUCN does that I think a lot of people have heard of is the red list of species. And for the people who are watching this, I have the red list book here behind me near the oh, Darth Vader <laughs> that I have uh, yeah. in the background. And uh, so the red list of species is a really important tool for understanding the health of species across the planet. You know, over 100,000 species have now been evaluated uh, NatureServe is working with IUCN and other organizations on the global reptile assessment right now, which will increase the number of species that have been evaluated by a pretty large number. Uh, but, and so the, the red list of species is really important. It's been around for a long time. But one of the things that you're very involved in is something that's maybe a little bit more subtle for people, but so the red list of ecosystems. So yeah. why is that important and how, do, how, do, how can we get people to understand the difference between species and ecosystems in this context. Yeah, I, I'm unfortunately not that involved with the Red List of Ecosystems anymore, but I was certainly involved at the beginning. And uh, so the way that I see it is that you think of biodiversity. So you go to the Convention of, Bio the Convention of Biological Diversity, and uh, it covers from genes to ecosystems. So genes, species, and ecosystems are the three, uh, you know, kinds of biodiversity that it that it deals with. And uh, they all, when, when you look at threats to them, they all show different views of the same picture. And when, when ecosystems have something very interesting, which is an ecosystem may decline before its species are gone. So you could have a shrinking ecosystem and then uh, species are still hanging on. And we call that the extinction debt. So it's that it's that debt that will be paid in the future by bringing species closer to extinction. So if you detect ecosystem decline on time, you might actually be preventing species extinctions later on. So it's a very important tool to help us look at how different degradation processes are operating. And uh, and I really think that it's uh, it, you know for some people. A species, you know, like the panda, for example, it's a very famous uh, conservation symbol. But uh, for some species, it's, it's being at a place, you know, and seeing the place change what uh, captures their attention. So what we do in IUCN is that we look at 
the decline of both species and ecosystems and uh, uh, are able that way to capture a greater diversity of the degradation process and also uh, be able to anticipate and act before it's all gone. So it's, it's just different ways to look at, at how we impact nature. Yeah, so I'm really interested in the anticipate part of what you just said as we think about yeah. global climate change and how that affects species differently. You know, plants and animals and some some animals are able to migrate more easily than others and some have wider tolerances than others. And what we're going to see in our lifetimes in terms of new assemblages of species and what that means in terms of protecting ecosystems as they change not naturally because it's a human caused climate change but they react to the new environment around them regardless of habitat degradation by fragmentation or development or something I'm, it's it's something that's really hard for me to get my head around yeah no, it's a big challenge and it's one of those things you know i i often hear people say you know there's nowhere left on earth that on earth that is pristine it's all been touched by humans with climate change. And I think that's true, but I think it's also false because there are some parts of the world that are really under very little influence by humans and they're very remote and they're very big. And uh, to some extent, I feel that that attitude of saying there's nothing left is a little bit defeatist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, in the end, it is not so much whether it has been touched or not. Uh, for me, the importance is whether it can bounce back. And if you have all the ingredients there in place, you know, even if they have been impacted to some extent, if you have all the ingredients in place, then they can return. Lots of examples of nature that has bounced back. You know, we've seen it in the sea, we've seen it in land and freshwater. So um, uh, having these large ecosystems in place is what gives Earth the capacity to recover. And I think we should fight for them no matter what. I, I think that's a really great optimistic um, attitude to have because you're right, it could be very easy to get defeatist about it as you think about the trajectory that we're on. But the bouncing back is accurate. We saw it actually earlier this year when the shutdowns first started and cities and places were very, very quiet and wildlife coming back into places where it hadn't been seen, but clearly they thought it was a habitat. Uh, and it gives you it gives you hope for um, what could happen if we were able to, you know, confine our footprint a little bit uh, in terms of nature being able to bounce back. Uh, so speaking of the uh, the pandemic, um, you know, the connection between biodiversity and human health um, has obviously never been talked about more than it is being talked about right now. Um, in your in your work, is that changing the nature of what you do? Um, is it, do you think it's affecting the policies of the governments in places like Venezuela? Or uh, what, do you, what do you see as, uh, I wanna, I'm looking for another optimistic answer here. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we have been, so one thing that we do at the SSC is uh, uh, we call them situation analysis, which is look at the scientific literature and see what science tells us about particular conservation problems. We try to remain, you know, as objective as possible, as detached uh, from our personal agendas as possible, and try to see what the data says. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's the best that we can do. And when we look at the pandemic, we see that uh, this kind of reaction of that nature is our enemy. That like you've heard, we've heard a little bit the idea that you know, if we continue encroaching upon nature, we'll keep getting sicker as more and more diseases come and hit us. Um, there's no evidence of that. So what we find is that uh, it is not exactly, that's not the mechanism. The mechanism is the life we create around humans, which are surrounded by very intensive uses of, of the landscape, including livestock of many kinds. And it's those environments, highly artificial environments, that end up being the breeding area of pathogens. So it's not nature itself, it's the way that we transform nature for benefit that creates environments very favorable to pathogens. So it is not really, so, so what I think that that tells us is that actually keeping nature 
in a, you know, as healthy and as big as possible and interacting with nature is still the best way out. And then thinking, rethinking the way that we produce our food in our cities and, you know, the way that we live is a much more important. So nature is not the enemy. Our lifestyle is the enemy. And the good thing about that is that we can transform our lifestyle accordingly. So, so what, what we have been finding is that there's evidence. There, I mean, I'm sorry. There's no evidence that we have to be afraid of nature. Quite the opposite. Nature is uh, not <laughs> the source of these of these imbalances. It is our lifestyle. And uh, so what? Well, it's in our hands. Yeah, no, that's great to hear, and uh, seems to be uh, seems to be accurate. And hopefully, um, we will learn from this and uh, make some make some lifestyle changes as a as a species. Um, you know, well, we already we already have. I mean, it's amazing just to see uh, you know th this conversation that usually would have been in person probably somewhere, <laughs> and now the fact true. that we're having all these encounters remotely already is a, a clear sign of uh, how we're changing. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I was curious about another issue that you've written about um, and that has been in the news recently, and that is essentially the personal risk that some people take in advocating for conservation. Um, in, in many countries around the world, it is taking your life into your hands to get yeah. involved in conservation. Uh, in, in Honduras and in other countries, um, environmental activists are essentially being assassinated um, for their work. And uh, that's, a, that's something that's not being talked about very much right now. Uh, and I'm glad you're raising awareness about it. Yeah, it's not being talked about and we hope to make it a big issue at the World Conservation Congress of the UCN that hopefully will be next year uh, in Marseille in France. Um, it is, it is becoming one of the most costly professions, you know, environmental defenders mm -hmm. are, are seriously, uh, you know, persecuted not only by governments, but also by private companies that work, you know, at the edge of, uh, of legality. And, um, you know, the environment is often, the, the fight for the environment is a curious one because uh, we sometimes trap in the position of being perceived as, as people who resist uh, development. And uh, that means that by doing that, we're really enemies of society and well-being. And uh, that gives the justification and the excuse uh, for someone to take in their hands and uh, you know, harm these people who are uh, seen as uh, not allowing the rest of the community to develop. And it's often not the case. You know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, very frequently you can see that many of the agendas that these environmental defenders have are actually based on sustainable development, sustainable use of wildlife, on community, community uh, participation. So, um, yeah, we have to be careful about that because it is certainly a growing, in Latin America in particular, is one of the biggest uh, places where these uh, offenses are taking place. Yeah. It's really, it's really tragic. Um, and you're right, it is often around the ideas of sustainable development and making people's lives better. And it really should be possible to, to do both. Um, you know, we don't always have the best track record of doing that, but, you know, we work to do that. And one of the things actually that NatureServe does is we engage with industry um, proactively to help them do a better job of avoiding having negative impacts on biodiversity uh, so that yeah. they can do, do the right thing by, by society and by nature. And it's, um, it's really important to have, you know, activists who are out there working on one side, but also to have organizations that are willing to work with industry to, to have the best, uh, the best outcomes. You know, I was, I was at the Rio Plus 20 meeting in, uh, in Brazil a few years ago. And there were two simultaneous summits taking place, the government summit, and then the kind of informal uh, private sector plus um, uh, local governments, so states and municipalities, those, that kind of level. Those were parallel summits taking place. And the really interesting thing to me was the governments were awfully slow and uh, bureaucratic, and they, in the end, they didn't reach to any, any conclusion that was meaningful. But you went to the other summits, the ones that were of the private sector and the, and the local government. And there was a lot more going on. There mm -hmm. were a lot more 
more, more willing to take risks, more, much more, uh, you know, creative in the solution. Right. And, uh, and I think that that's something that society is pushing because citizens are much more likely to influence local governments and uh, private companies even as, as, as consumers. And I think that really working with those sectors, uh, you know, gives us a much better chance to change than to just focus on the, on the national level. Right. So, John Paul, you've been working for 20, 30 years on uh, environmental conservation issues and biodiversity conservation. And uh, of course, you know, a lot of people right now are talking about David Attenborough because of his new special on Netflix. And uh, yeah. he's 93 years old now and probably has done more than anybody in the last century in terms of raising awareness about nature and how spectacular it is and how important it is. Um, and I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about is, you know, when I'm 93, what do I want to be able to say I accomplished um, in my life? And uh, so I'm doing a little survey and you get to be one of the victims of this question. So I'm, I'm very curious to know, like, what would you consider to be a success at the end of your career? Like, what would be the thing where you would be able to say, I did, I did something, I made a difference? Yeah, well, I, you know, my, my, just a parenthesis, I, I'm the Jacques Cousteau generation. So I was uh, as motivated as Jacques Cousteau as I was. <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> Possibly more by him originally. <laughs> anyway, um, um, so, so what I feel is that, is that conservation works. When you look at uh, examples of species that have been brought back from the brink of extinction or ecosystems that have recovered, there are lots of examples of those cases. And uh, all it takes is a, a bunch of people putting their heads together and acting. Uh, when you look at how much is spent on destroying nature than on conserving nature, the imbalance is huge. There is much more money spent on destroying nature. So my my mission is to tip that balance mm. slightly in favor of nature. And like I said before, let nature recover. Uh, if I could say, you know, when I'm 93, that there are five species, one species, 10 species that are in a better condition than they were because of something that I did or people close to me did, then that's what I need to do. And, uh, and I feel that's happening. In the, in the SSC, um, there's a clear desire from our leadership to say, when you ask a SSC specialist group chair, you know, what they want from me as, as their coordinator, as their leader, they say to me, you know, I like doing the red list. I know how to do it. We, are, we all do it. We assess species. We, we compile the science. We do all, the, all that is needed document and inform the public. But what I want to be remembered for is for saving species, not for listening. And my mission in SSC is to make sure that they can save. And then if, if I could take some credit for that later on, then that's it. That's fantastic. And I love that answer. Um, obviously, working in NatureServe, where we're trying to also recover species and prevent extinction, um, that's exactly in line with our mission and what we're trying to accomplish. So that is a beautiful answer from my perspective. Um, so because uh, you have been so interesting to listen to, I have done all of the asking of the questions um, and haven't given you a chance to ask any questions. If you have anything that you want to ask, um, it could be- Well, you know, you know there, there are always these buzzwords that you think that I was wondering about nature service, kind of how do you confront? So there are these ideas of, uh, you know, people always talk about extinction rates and how, you know, the world has had gone through these different mass extinction events. And, uh, you know, there've been a few, and then the humans are now being connected to the sixth extinction, uh, you know, mass global extinction. What, what is it? Uh, how do you present this to your members and how do you, uh, inform them that, you know, this is taking place? Well, how, how do you package this when you communicate this? Yeah, it, it can be very challenging because it can be an extremely depressing answer because we're causing species to go extinct at 100 to 1,000 times the natural background rate as humans and because of our activity. 
And you know, one of the things that's hard when you're talking to donors or to people who are interested in your issues is, you know, you don't want to necessarily scare them too much, which is why your optimistic answers have been really uh, encouraging here. Um, and I think being able to talk about the work that NatureServe does with data and technology and our partnerships with groups like IUCN and others around the, around the globe to try and protect species is really the message we need to get out there. But I do end up, you know, a lot of people in our field, of course, sixth extinction is a thing that we say, a lot of people don't really know that there have been all these extinction events in history other than the dinosaurs. And so um, explaining that this is something that has happened many times in history of the planet, but now we're doing it through, not through some natural process, but through a human caused process that is potentially happening faster than it happened at any of the other extinctions um, is, is sobering for people to hear. Uh, and you have to come up with examples of species that they are aware of that have disappeared for them to really uh, internalize it. Uh, so it is, it is a challenging, uh, it is a challenging uh, topic to, to talk about because it is so easy to just sort of make people feel hopeless. And so talking yeah. about the work of, of resiliency of species, um, of course, in the United States, a great example is the bald eagle. You know, we were all afraid that the bald eagle was going to go extinct. And now, you know, they're pretty stable, secure species. And uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful story to be able to tell. And uh, we're, we're hoping to tell more and more of those stories as our, as our work gets you know, stronger and, and gets out there more. But, you know, the sixth extinction is a, is a challenging topic for us because it is yeah. not an optimistic one. Yeah. And what do you see? What What do you see in in terms of uh, in the future role of NatureServe in uh, in the network? So mobilizing members throughout the Americas and other parts of the world. What's your from from your perspective? What do you see happening in the next few years? Yeah, one of the things that's really exciting about right now is is data essentially the amount of data that are being generated from remote sensing and from drones and things like lidar. Uh, that can be incorporated into systems to understand ecosystems better, to understand where species are, uh, I think is going to transform what we're able to do. So in the United States and Canada, we have this history of very on the ground person in the field collecting very specific data about very specific species. And that methodology doesn't work everywhere. It does, certainly doesn't work in places with the kind of diversity that you see in Venezuela or throughout the, the tropical world. Um, and we'll never catch up, right? Every time we turn around, we're discovering a new species. And so if we try and do them all manually, one person at a time, one species at a time, we'll never, we'll never get there. And so being able to use uh, cloud computing and big data and artificial intelligence to bring all of these different kinds of data together so that we can understand the systems that we're trying to protect, I think is sort of the, where we're trying to go. And so NatureServe is digging in with uh, a lot of the big tech firms that everybody's heard of, Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure and uh, Google X to um, understand how we can analyze these data and take these data in the cloud and pull in all sorts of different sources and use AI and modeling to really understand the world a little bit better. And what that should allow us to do is work more effectively in places where um, they don't have that same uh, history of being able to collect the kinds of data that we have up here in North America. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. It's, it's daunting on one level because the, quantity of data and the cost of doing this work is, is significant, but I think the outcomes are potentially huge. And of course, once we've figured it out once, then you can do it everywhere because that's the way that it works with this cloud computing and, and the data sources. So we're, we're working really hard to uh, adjust our data model and our um, geospatial cloud infrastructure to be able to adapt to and uh, suck in more different kinds of data into what they call a data lake um, so that we can extract more more useful information everywhere not just in uh, in north america so stay tuned okay. for that well, looking forward to being part of that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely 
Well, uh, John Paul, thank you for your time today. It was great to catch up. As you said, you know, we're doing it over Zoom instead of hanging out in Marseille at the World Conservation Congress. Um, but hopefully we will get to do that again and see each other in person because that is always, uh, always a fun time. And I uh, appreciate very much all that you have done and will continue to do to uh, preserve species around the planet. Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to chat and look forward to getting together soon. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, this has been Bye -bye. Conservation Conversations with Sean O'Brien and my guest, John Paul Rodriguez. And uh, we've been really thrilled to have this conversation. And we will look forward to uh, continuing to work with him and the IUCN and Provita going forward. Thank you very much.